introduction. <laughs> I forgot I had done all of that stuff. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm taking a slightly different look at this topic, um, drawing on some recent research that I've done, and asking the sub-question here, will the Commonwealth have the skills to compete? Um, so I'm going to backtrack a little tonight and revisit some of the labor market issues that others may have covered or that you might have seen, and ask specifically whether or not the Commonwealth uh, will have the skilled workforce it needs to meet the jobs of the future. And then Alan will um, follow up looking at the fiscal issues that were alluded to in the very excellent movie that was <laughs> put together. So. There we go. Um, this one came out of um, things that we're hearing from policymakers and business leaders um, around the Commonwealth and also around the New England region as a whole. Um, who were concerned that the state's slower population growth, the greater out-migration that we've had over previous decades, uh, would lead to a shortage of skilled labor, particularly when the baby boom generation retires. And prior to the recession, the concern was that a lack of skilled labor would hamper um, future economic growth by creating barriers for companies looking to locate or expand in Massachusetts. And of course, this is a timely topic, given that Fidelity just announced they're moving 1,100 jobs from Massachusetts, from their Middleborough facility to Rhode Island and New Hampshire. Um, more recently, the worry is that a lack of skilled workers will make it difficult to fill jobs when the Massachusetts economy recovers, given that a lot of those jobs will require post-secondary education and training of some sort. So the concern is not only having a shortage in terms of the number of workers in Massachusetts when the baby boom generation retires, but whether or not the future generations that are coming into the labor force will have the right mix of skills to meet the needs um, of the economy going forward. And you, so you might find it a little odd that policymakers have these concerns given the abundance of labor right now in the middle of the recession or as we're recovering. Um, but indeed, the population of college-educated adults has been growing more slowly here than in other parts of the country. And a lot of this is due to our slower population growth. So if you have fewer uh, young adults that are coming of age and going to college, you have fewer individuals to put through the education pipeline, that means fewer um, adults of, uh, who have college degrees. And since 1990, you can see that the number of individuals aged 25 to 64 years with um, any post-secondary education has risen by only 30% compared to 43% nationwide. And the other thing is that we've been growing this population slow, slower than the rest of the nation with each passing decade. Um, in addition, the slowdown in terms of the population of college graduates differs by the level of skill. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about the distribution of educational attainment tonight. And we're talking about low skill individuals, who are those individuals with a high school degree or less, middle skill individuals, who are individuals with some college or an associate's degree, and high skill individuals who have a bachelor's degree or above. So here, the state's population of high skill individuals, those who have a bachelor's degree or higher, grew at a rate that exceeded the nation during the 1980s and then slowed since then, falling behind the nation in the most recent decade. However, among middle skill individuals, so these are people with only some college or an associate's degree, the Commonwealth's growth rate has consistently been below that of the nation. And what's even more troubling is that since 2000, we've actually seen a decrease in this population. So today I'm gonna to talk about three main policy questions. First, how has the skill mix of um, New England and the Commonwealth's workforce compared to demand over the past several decades? Um, indeed, there's a potential mismatch already underway. Uh, we'll see that the structure of the U.S. economy has been changing dramatically over the past se several decades, leading to an increase in the demand for skilled workers. So the reduced role of the manufacturing sector, um, increased importance of the professional service and knowledge-based sectors has increased the demand for skilled workers. Second, what are the unique labor supply constraints that New England and Massachusetts will face in the future? So while Massachusetts boasts one of the most educated populations in the nation, um, <coughs> significant demographic changes suggest that the supply of skilled workers may not meet demand in the future. And indeed, our simulations show that um, there's likely to be a potential mismatch between the level of skill in the population and that which is demanded by employers, particularly in this middle skill category. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about that tonight. And then finally, what role can public policy play in addressing these potential gaps in the region and in the state? Um, right now, of course, the replacement of jobs that are, have been lost through the Great Recession is of the primary importance, but if we take a longer term view, 
um, making sure that the Commonwealth's population has the right mix of skills to meet the jobs that are being demanded in the future is going to be key. And although to some degree we'll see that market forces can alleviate this potential mismatch, so we might see people migrating into the state who have that set of skills, we might see more people choosing to go to community college than otherwise would have, um, we might see baby boomers decide, deciding to stay in the labor force longer. As we'll see, our projections show that those potential market forces are pretty small compared to the size of this gap. And so that suggests that there still is a role for public policy to play. And in particular, we're going to focus on um, strengthening the community college system. So despite the region's slower population growth that we've experienced over the past several decades, because we've had high and rising rates of educational attainment, we've actually seen an increase in the fraction of our population that has post-secondary education and training. So here, if you look at the share of individuals who have a bachelor's degree or higher, you can see that Massachusetts is that red line at the top. Um, the share of the population uh, with a bachelor's degree has risen from roughly 23% in 1980 to nearly 40% as of 2006. And it's risen at a rate that's far faster than the rest of the nation. And this is because even though we had fewer individuals of college going age, um, more individuals chose to go into college. Uh, and so we ended up with a higher share of the population with a college degree. However, the share of middle school individuals has not grown nearly as rapidly and lags behind that of most other states. So now we're the red line that's in the middle of the pack or actually at the bottom as of 2006. And so while some might argue that Massachusetts has been successful in moving individuals from the middle to the top of the distribution, the question remains why haven't we been as successful moving people from the bottom into the middle to backfill as people have been moving up in the education distribution. Now one way we can measure um, the potential imbalance between supply and demand is to look at the relative wages of skilled workers of different levels. So basic economic principles tell us that when the supply of a good increases relative to demand, the price of that good decreases relative to all other goods, all else being equal. However, if the supply of a good increases while the price is increasing, then that would mean that demand is increasing more rapidly than supply. And we can apply these same principles to the labor force by looking at relative wages. So here we're looking at trends in hourly wages um, by education level over time for workers with similar characteristics. And what we're looking at here is what's known as the wage premium. So that's the percentage increase in average, average hourly earnings for individuals with any post-secondary education and training relative to those with a high school degree. So for example, in 1980, a male worker in Massachusetts with a college degree, a bachelor's degree, earned about 40% more than an individual, the same, a similar individual with only a high school degree. And by 2006, that premium had grown to about 70%. So, and you can see that this happened all over the country, it happened across all sorts of states, it happened for the nation as well. So we've seen these rising premiums for individuals um, who have a bachelor's degree. What's probably a little less known is that this is also true for individuals with an associate's degree. So in 1980, men with an associate's degree earned about 13% more than a similar individual with a high school degree. And by 2006, that, um, that premium had more than doubled to over 30%. The other thing that's key to notice here is that um, whereas in, for individuals with only a bachelor's degree, you can see after 2000, the, the premium tapered off. We haven't seen as much of an increase. This kind of makes sense. It jives with the supply trends that we've seen, given that Massachusetts has greatly expanded the share of the population with a bachelor's degree compared to what's happened at the national level. However, if you look at the premium for associate's degree holders, it's still been rising, and it's above that which um, exists at the national level. And again, this kind of jives with the supply um, trends that I showed you earlier, where, again, we haven't been producing as many individuals with an associate's degree compared to other states. Why has the demand for college-educated workers been rising? Well, we've seen that Massachusetts employers are willing to pay a premium for skilled workers despite there being relatively more of them. And in addition, these premiums have been growing over time, indicating that the demand for such workers has been rising. But what's really driving these trends? Well, there's two forces at work here. One possibility is that the share of employment accounted for by the various industries has shifted over time towards those that use more college-educated labor. And that's indeed something that's happened since 1990 as we see employment shifting out of uh, manufacturing and production and into professional services um, and other knowledge-based sectors. 
The other thing is that we can see an increase in the demand for college educated workers within industries. So as technology improves, we see within industries, even those that don't typically use a lot of college educated labor, we see an increasing demand for individuals who have some kind of post-secondary post education and training. If you do um, a decomposition of employment over time into these two forces, it turns out that most of it can be accounted for by shifts within industries over time, meaning that all industries are increasing their demand for college educated workers. And this is an important point for policy because if it were just isolated to a few key industries that were growing, we would really want to target education and training to just those industries, like say in healthcare or education or professional services. But really the use of college educated labor is much more widespread and pervasive throughout the economy. So that suggests we would want to take a more broad-based approach. In addition, um, this isn't something that's just been occurring within industries, but we can also look within specific occupations. Um, and so the share of employment accounted for by the various occupations has shifted over time as well. Again, out of production and manufacturing type occupations and into occupations um, that are much more likely to require a degree of some sort. So towards occupations such as education, healthcare, financial operations, et cetera, that employ a large, scale, uh, large number of college educated workers. And one way we can measure the imbalance between supply and demand uh, within occupations is to look at job vacancy rates. Um, so this is showing you uh, vacancy rates over time <coughs> in 2006 and 2009. And on the x-axis, we have the share um, of workers within that occupation that have any kind of post-secondary education and training. So this could be um, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or higher. And you can see that there's an upward sloping relationship where um, those occupations that use a greater share of college educated labor have higher job vacancy rates. And the other thing that's really key to notice is that not only are, do they have higher vacancy rates in 2006, but they persisted largely through 2009. So in the middle of a recession, you'll find key occupations in healthcare, in education, in um, IT, that have job vacancy rates of 10%, 20%, 30% even, which are significantly higher than what one would expect in the middle of a recession. The other thing is that this does not just rely on um, high skill workers. There's a subset of occupations in these that rely on middle skill workers. So particularly in the healthcare field, we're talking about technicians, surgical technicians, medical sonographers, um, all sorts of healthcare workers that are complementary, in fact, to a lot of the high skill workers that we find in those sectors. So given the demographic changes on the horizon, it's likely that the Commonwealth will face an even greater labor supply constraint in the future. And our projections indicate that the Massachusetts population will stagnate and then shrink over the next two decades, while that of the nation will grow. So between 2009 and 2019, you can see that the total population is expected to grow by only 3.3%. Again, this is individuals aged 25 to 64 years, so I'm just looking at the working age population. And then in the subsequent decade, will shrink by about 1.1%. In comparison, you can see that the nation's uh, population is projected to grow somewhere between 9 and 11% in each of those two decades. And in addition, if we just look at labor force, so if we take into account labor force participation rates, those individuals who are likely to participate in the labor force, you can see that the situation is even more dire where in the coming decade, 2019 to 2029, we'll expect to see the labor force shrink by 2%. So in terms of numbers, we're already behind the rest of the nation. The other thing that's going to happen is the composition of the state's labor force is going to change dramatically as well. And it's going to shift to include a greater share of minority and foreign-born uh, populations, although to a lesser degree than the nation. But in comparison between 2009 and 2029, we'll see uh, the fraction of the population that is white will decrease from about 80% or so to about 60% and the slice of the pie that will grow most dramatically will be that of the Hispanic population. And this is also something that's gonna occur in the rest of the nation. Why is this important? Well, <clears throat> uh, minority and immigrant populations typically have lower educational attainment than native white populations. And so as the composition of the population and the labor force changes, we'll expect to see uh, the educational attainment of the population slow over time. And that's indeed what we find when we make our projections. 
So in 2009, roughly 8% or so of the population has an associate's degree. <clears throat> By 2019, that, uh, that share drops to about 7.8%, and by 2029, it drops to 7%. In contrast, you see a smaller drop off um, in the rest of the nation. So in terms of the distribution of skill, if we look at all low, middle, and high skill, Massachusetts still leads in terms of the share of the population that's considered to be high skill. But in terms of the share of the population in that middle skill category, we're still projected to lag behind the rest of the nation. What's going to happen to labor demand? So to examine this, we take employment projections uh, by detailed occupation, then we assign jobs to education levels over time, and then we sum over all um, employment within the education level um, to get the total number of workers demanded by each by each sector here. And we make two projections. So <coughs> our lower bound estimate um, takes into account that shift in the population that I just showed you. So as the population includes more minority and immigrants, um, we take their typical uh, educational attainment, assign that to the new entrants coming into the workforce, and that's what um, the lower bound estimate looks like. Um, in terms of the upper bound estimate, uh, what we do is we take the occupational distribution um, of workers who have particular education within that occupation, and then we apply the change that's occurred over the last decade. So we've seen that within occupations, there's an increasing share of, the pop of workers uh, with a college degree. So we've taken that change over time and applied it to that. So I want you to think of the lower bound estimate as maintaining the status quo. That is to say, if a firm had to go out and hire workers to replace those that are leaving, they would hire workers with similar characteristics. Think of the upper bound estimate here as um, a measure of upscaling. <coughs> what would it look like if current trends continued and employers were continuing to demand a greater um, or more educated workforce? And as you can see here, whether or not you look at the lower bound estimate or the upper bound estimate, demand will shift <coughs> either slightly or more greatly towards the upper end of the education distribution. It remains roughly um, steady for the middle scale distribution if you combine both some college and the associate's degree categories, and it declines slightly for the low scale category. How do supply and demand um, and demand projections <coughs> match up? Well, the number of workers is likely to fall short of demand. And as you can see, this, demand, this imbalance is not going to be distributed <coughs> evenly across skill levels. And the greatest imbalance is going to be, again, what I mentioned in this middle skill category. So <coughs> if you look at the sum college and the associate's degree categories um, in Massachusetts, the middle skill category uh, will fall short by roughly 30% of the number of workers. So the number of job openings will roughly be 30% greater than the number of workers in that category, compared to about a 15% gap. For the nation as a whole. The other thing is that even at this level of detail, our analysis is going to fall short of what potentially might be a mismatch within the economy as well. Because even if we measure just by differing degrees, it could be the case that individuals are getting degrees that don't match up exactly with what is being demanded in the economy. So for example, if we told everybody to go out and get an associate's degree, that still wouldn't solve the problem because it could be the case the greatest shortage is within um, the registered nursing program. And so what we really need is for people to be getting nursing degrees, not just associate's degrees. Now more importantly, rather than just the gap in terms of the number of workers, because we've seen the population projectors and the population projections, we know that there are fewer workers um, slated to be there in the coming decades, is me measuring up um, the mix of skills to the mix of jobs. So here I'm looking at the percentage of individuals um, who have low skill, middle skill, and high skill credentials versus the percentage of jobs that are going to be requiring low, middle, and high skill credentials. And again, the greatest mismatch is in the middle um, skill category. In Massachusetts, it's a 2 to 4% gap if you add up the some college and associate's degree categories. In the U.S. as a whole, it's about a 1 to 2% gap. And you can see as well, if you look at the high skill categories, I don't want to say we have an abundance of high skill labor, but certainly that's an area where we're better off than in the middle scale categories. Now, according to our projections, if the college continuation rate um, of both entering and existing cohorts up to age 39 were raised by 20%, this would eliminate about a third of the gap. So it's a fairly large gap, and it's a hard gap to fill, 
because we can't just instantly give people uh, an associate's degree. It's going to take time for people to enter that pipeline and complete degrees. <coughs> As I mentioned before, I don't think that we can entirely rely on market forces alone. And there are a few reasons why uh, this differs for middle skill individuals versus high skill individuals. Um, for example, previous research has shown that workers in the middle of the distribution are less likely to migrate in response to wage differentials. So even if you could imagine a scenario where we have a shortage of middle skill workers, employers have to raise wages for those workers, we think that's going to attract workers into our state. It turns out that middle skill workers have fewer resources um, with which to migrate from state to state. There are also less, um, less information flows from across state borders towards middle skill workers. Um, similarly, other studies have shown that the gap in college attendance rates by parental income, race, and ethnicity remain large and may even widened over the past several decades, suggesting that there are significant impediments to individuals who would like to obtain post-secondary education and training, um, but may not have the financial means to do so. And this is particularly true in that middle skill category. The other thing is that even if employers would really like to provide their own training, and there are some employers that are doing that, um, even within Massachusetts, particularly in the healthcare sector. Um, if you look at, uh, we had an employer from Mass General talking about a surgical technician program that they had developed because they had a persistently high vacancy rate, I think it was 15% among surgical technicians. They developed their own program to take their administrative janitorial staff who would like to become um, surgical technicians and try to enhance their skills in that regard. And they found that there's a lot of barriers to doing that. One of them being there's a lot of remedial education that needs to take place. Um, another being that uh, they were concerned after having put these individuals through their training programs that they would be poached by other employers as well. And so that led to the formation of a healthcare consortium now with Mass General, Beth Israel, and a few other hospitals to do a joint training program. And one reason why employers um, are less able to make those investments is exactly because they're worried about other firms poaching um, uh, employees that they have trained, uh, typically in other occupations such as accounting or other places where you see kind of these more structured training programs. Firms can often pay a lower wage while the individual is getting trained. They see the payoff at the end when they finish their training, they get a bump up in a promotion. This doesn't necessarily happen in middle skill um, jobs because the wages are often lower. So a lot of times the employer can't even lower the wages below what would be the going rate because of minimum wage laws, and then, <coughs> again, they wouldn't bump them up as much on the other side of training program. The other thing that um, has been suggested is that, well, there's outsourcing, um, there's uh, um, all sorts of uh, jobs that are being automated that are going away that are in this middle skill category. David Otter at MIT has done a lot of work on this, um, and that's definitely true that this middle skill category contains certain occupations such as bookkeeping, um, some administrative functions, uh, clerk type positions that are shrinking. Um, but at the same time, there are sort of new middle skill categories that are being created, particularly in healthcare and education that are not easily outsourced or automated. So um, the example I gave from Mass General, um, we had uh, an individual uh, who was running their training program who explained that if they don't have enough surgical technicians, they can't do as many surgeries as they would like. And that means doing fewer surgeries, uh, people waiting longer for surgeries, um, or trying to find some other creative solutions. So it does have very direct impacts and it's not something that can necessarily be easily outsourced. And then finally, I, I pointed out that we seem to have an advantage in terms of creating um, high skill workers, those with a bachelor's degree or above, and it's definitely been suggested, well, those individuals are even overqualified to take these middle skill jobs. So really, maybe we don't have a problem at all. Like we could just you know, shift them into these other jobs. Well, the problem is that those folks do migrate and they respond to wage differences and job opportunities very strongly. And we've seen that in the migration numbers that individuals um, who are more educated are much more likely to leave um, the Commonwealth. So even though we might think that those individuals would stick around for a while and do those jobs, over time, if they're qualified to do a high skill job in another state, they'll take that opportunity. So <clears throat> our results suggest that in addition to ongoing efforts to expand more traditional four-year baccalaureate attainment, policymakers should consider specific training and education 
policies that target growing categories of middle skill jobs. But at the same time, our higher education system seems skewed towards private institutions that produce bachelor degree holders. So I think prior to this, um, I wasn't even really aware of the college, community college system in Massachusetts. And indeed, um, to a large degree, uh, it's not as much of a system as you might find in other states. Um, I've talked to a number of community college presidents um, in Massachusetts, and they each have their own board of directors. Um, the presidents make and set policy in terms of um, not just tuition, and, well, not tuition, but fees, uh, but also courses, uh, transcripts, transfer credits, um, admissions criteria. They operate pretty independently. Um, and at the same time, we also, um, if we think we haven't done a very good job of funding the UMass system, we've done an even worse job in terms of funding the community college system. At the same time, the role of our community colleges has really expanded. So initially, community colleges were created um, as a stepping stone to a four-year degree or as um, a, um, a less costly alternative to higher education. And now we ask community colleges to do things like uh, English as a second language training, um, workforce development training, um, remedial education, a whole host of different things um, without very much funding to do it. And then finally, um, community college enrollment has been increasing, but college completion rates have not. Um, and I'll show you in just a minute actually how low they are. Um, they're quite shocking. So even if we increase the number of individuals who are attending community colleges, um, we're going to get a lot less bang for our buck because so few of them actually complete the degree. So um, in Massachusetts, uh, about 17% of community college students complete um, degrees. Um, and this is completion over a three, a six year period actually. And we rank 32nd out of the United States. Um, if you look at four year public institutions, um, our completion rate is slightly above the nation. And obviously our four year private institutions, um, the completion rate is much higher than the rest of the nation. So it's a little embarrassing to some degree that um, we've kind of really failed um, in this sector of the higher education system. In terms of uh, funding, part of the problem is a lack of funding. So if you look in per capita terms, Massachusetts um, is uh, below the national average in terms of funding. If you convert that to a full-time enrollment, because our, a lower share of our population is attending community college, um, we actually rank a little bit better. Um, but I would argue that's actually only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that there are a number of challenges for these students um, to face uh, going forward. And as I just told you before, a lot of the future gaps that I'm talking about stem from changes in the composition of the labor force towards greater shares of minority and foreign-born students, um, and so further means in educational attainment among these disadvantaged groups is going to require not only an increase in terms of financial aid, but it's also going to require um, greater college uh, readiness. And in addition to financial assistance, these students often face greater challenges because they're really not often your 18-year-old freshman who is first going to college. That's a really small part of the community college student body population. I think uh, Mary Fifield at Bunker Hill told me it's only maybe 20% of their student population is that 18-year-old first-time college student. Most of their students, I think the average age is 28. They often have families. Um, they're almost all holding jobs. And very small things can interrupt their community college experience. Like, um, my car broke down, I can't afford to get it fixed, I can't go to class. Uh, my roommate moved out, uh, I, I gotta cover their rent, I gotta work more, I can't go to class. So, community colleges have been um, experimenting with different things. Other states have done things like um, offering not just remedial courses, but stipends, childcare, transportation. Um, and indeed, Bunker Hill has done a similar thing. They've gotten a grant from the Lumina Foundation to provide emergency grants to students. So you can walk into um, the Office of uh, Student Services and apply for an emergency grant within three days, walk out, to, uh, walk out of the office with up to $1,000. That can be applied to fixing your car, covering your rent, whatever it is that's going to interrupt your uh, community college experience. And then finally, um, the other challenge is that these middle skill jobs often require um, specific skill sets rather than general knowledge. So greater communication between firms that hire middle skill workers 
um, and the institutions that are educating them is really necessary to make sure that these students come out with degrees and training that's going to actually get them a job. And I think that's certainly one concern with the for-profit colleges that have bubbled up and um, really kind of taken a hold in this uh, sector of the higher education system and is um, in some sense sort of taking away from the community college system uh, because they look like they're being more proactive or more linked to uh, jobs on the other side, which in fact, mm, that may or may not be the case. They have a tendency to not entirely stay in business for long enough for the individual to get to enough training to get a job. The other thing is that um, places like Bunker Hill are doing things like um, partnering with local employers to provide training, but it's really happening on a very ad hoc basis. It's hard for the community colleges to do this. They don't have the resources to um, suddenly uh, hire faculty and develop a curriculum for an employer. So it really doesn't happen unless there's a grant um, that they receive to do that or the employer comes in with money to do that. And that's part of what um, President Obama's um, uh, proposed um, plan to um, uh, for Skills for America's Future, where there is now a, um, a slice of funding for community college programs that all of the community colleges are bidding for to actually create greater um, institution and private sector partnerships to address these issues. So there are already efforts underway to address um, this issue. Uh, one of those is a um, campaign by what's known as SkillWorks, or Skills to Compete Massachusetts, where they're looking at the entire workforce uh, development training sector to not only strengthen the community college system, but also um, to look at uh, other areas of workforce training that could be improved, because again, that's another fragmented um, policy arena. And then the other effort is actually coming from the governor's office um, and also through the Vision Project to have the community colleges um, create a more cohesive system and to create some um, synergies across, across the community colleges and some similarities and some consistency to actually strengthen them into a greater system. Um, so as I said, there are already efforts underway to make this skilled uh, workforce more productive. Um, and I'll now turn it over to Alan to discuss the fiscal implications. 